Good afternoon. I'm James Kime. I'm Duncan Tritam. I'm Heon Lee. I'm Kaisal Ali. And I'm Marty Bertrand. And today we were talking to you about uh, the, a internal core room catcher for GE Hitachi's S Prism reactor. This year we've been advised by Dr. Robert Hayes of North Carolina State University uh, with an industry sponsor in Dr. Eric Lowen from GE Hitachi. Uh, as necessary, we were provided uh, support of three Edisons from GE as well. For our project, we were asked to assess whether or not the lower plenum of the S Prism reactor could serve as an internal core catcher in the event of a major core disruption accident. Our goals for this project would ensure that the material within the catcher would both be subcritical and below any uh, material melting or te eutectic temperatures. As necessary, we were given freedom to redesign the lower plenum uh, to satisfy these constraints. Now, the S Prism itself uh, stands for a superpower reactor innovative small module. It's a, uh, it is a sodium fast reactor which puts out 840 megawatts thermal and with two systems connected to a single turbine produces 622 megawatts electric. During our analysis, we assumed there was some arbitrary amount of sodium contained within that would be trapped within the corium after the melt, which we have been referring to as porosity. We use this to do a parametric study for both our criticality and heat trust for assessment to see whether or not changing this volume would have a major impact on those two factors. These two equations you can see here is we used uh, along with a uh, a constant corium volume and known radius of the plenum to determine the geometry of our system once we've added porosity. Initially, we we're going to model porosity as an array of sodium spheres within the corium. However, when we went to heat transfer, we found this was computationally expensive and difficult to model. So for that, those purposes, we adjusted and modeled it as sodium rings. We didn't expect this to be a likely geometry after a melt. However, we determined it was the next best approximation. Uh, this figure here, you can see uh, the corium modeled with rings inside of it. Uh, when we went to do our final heat transfer, we also found due to some similar constraints, we had to lift the rings slightly so that the, they would be flush with the surface of the corium. So we also had to observe the corium composition for the criticality analysis, and we assumed that all the fuel and all the clad in contact with the fuel melted. And we used the most conservative model, which is basically assuming that the ratio of the, the areas of the cross section of the fuel pens, as shown in this equation down here. And you can see the figure. Um, that the yellow is the fuel, and the gap surrounds the fuel with the cloud around it, and all that is contained in the sodium coolant. And with this equation, we found that 67.95% was fuel and 32.05% was clad. And with the corium composition, we uh, found the elemental weight percentages and tabulated them here in this. Hey everyone. Okay, so for the first part of our presentation, we needed to figure out that if once the entire core melts and settles into the lower plenum, we need to figure out if that's going to go critical or not. And you can see through uh, this model here, we modeled it in both MC and P and scale. Uh, right here, the blue is cladding, the yellow is melted corium, <coughs> and the purple is sodium. And it's not. We didn't think it would be uh, critical at first because. As it melts, it also fills the plenum entirely and pretty much forms a pancake, which isn't very reactive. What we're, what we're concerned with is the addition of porosity, although it is adding a non-fissionable source to the corium. It also pushes the height up, which could potentially actually make a more reactive configuration. So this is the main model we used. Uh, we assumed that as the fuel melts through the core, it'll come off in stringers, and uh, as a result, it could actually trap balls of uh, sodium in the corium. So we assumed that a uniform array of balls would be the best uh, model of this system. But we don't know about these balls is the size of them. And if uh, through statistical variation or some, some 
possible other method if there is a way hetero any heterogeneous things could happen. So uh, we did a parametric study based on the size of those balls and a uniform versus more non-uniform methods. So these are the other two models that we used. One is a completely homogeneous model, although that is um, yellow, has been co uh, corium in the past. Uh, in this case, it is both corium and sodium. And the other model is a less uniform, uh, which is the rings, which is what we also used in ANSYS. So that, those are the two models we're going to use to, to determine the uniformity of the system. And these are the neutron flux graphs of each one of those models. As you can see, it's what you'd expect. Uh, more neutrons towards the middle, then they fall out as you go on, fall out drastically once you reach the cladding. This is our final results for the, uh, the bubble model that we used. And as you can see, it never reaches 0.84, and our concerns initially that the porosity could actually add reactivity were unfounded as it has a continuous negative slope. And we also did a study to determine if the actual ball size affects this, and we found that any reactivity influence is negligible for ball size. And this is a graph that compares uh, the bubble model, the ring model, and the homogeneous model. And as you can see, uh, most importantly, they are all negative uh, slopes, and they all none of them get ab above 0.84 k effective. And the homogeneous model is the most reactive, followed by the ring model, and the are followed by the bubble model, and then the ring model. So the heterogeneous were actually less reactive than the uniform cases. So in conclusion, after a parametric analysis of uh, all the credible cases that we could think of, uh, we determined that the lower plenum could actually safely, from a recriticality re perspective, it could safely contain the melted corium. Um, the RVAX played an important part in the removal of decay heat. It does this by natural air convection. The RVAX can maintain reactive temperatures during the lowest design limits. Um, it, does, it does this by natural circulation. Um, the RVAX is always operating and removing heat from the reactor. This picture right here shows the RVAX. As you can see, the silo cavity is in a plain view. This is a zoom that shows readily that the silo cavity is made of argon gas, containment vessel, hot air riser, cylinder, and a cold air downcomer. So in the process of the RVAX, heat is generated in the reactor core and is transferred to the argon gap to the containment vessel. The containment vessel is cooled by natural circulation. So here you see the cold air down coming. The air travels down until it reaches the reactor silo and is turned inward and upward and is heated by the containment vessel and the cylinder. The heated air is the hot air riser which travels up and releases into the atmosphere. We also had to evaluate eutectics for our heat transfer analysis. And as a quick review, um, a eutectic is basically when two solid phases and an interstitial fluid coexist. And the two elements that we were mostly concerned with were iron and uranium. And so we observed its um, binary phase diagram as shown here. And you can see that the upper region is a liquid phase and the bottom region is a solid phase. And following this line, you can see that there are two eutectic points, one at around 1,300 degrees Kelvin and the other at around 980 degrees Kelvin. And so we decided that our corium eutectic limit um, temperature would be 980 degrees Kelvin as the worst case scenario. And we also found that the penetration rate at 1,075 degrees Kelvin was 0 0.015 micrometers per, sec uh, per second. The next step of our uh, safety analysis was a heat transfer analysis um, of the melted corium within our lower plenum. We did this using uh, a program called ANSYS. Our first step was to find the decay heat generation within our lower plenum from the corium. We then found our material properties. We determined what would be a worst case scenario during this uh, corium melt. We then modeled the heat transfer of our entire system using the uh, RVAX. Um, for the RVAX system, we assumed that its heat removal potential could match that of having the reactor vessel sitting in ambient air. Um, 
We then compared the zero porosity to the porosity models within ANSYS um, in respect to uh, eutectic melt as well as uh, heat removal. Our initial conditions, uh, we found that the uh, melt temperature of the, fuel, uh, the metal fuel within our reactor is around 1200 degrees Kelvin and that it maintains that temperature as it falls off on stringers and settles at the bottom of our plenum. Typical uh, reactor operation is around 600 degrees Kelvin, and so we modeled our sodium and uh, vessel to be this temperature. We then assumed that the entirety of our core would melt during this accident due to some sort of, you know, all the control rods ejecting an accident, who knows, something bad. We then decided that um, further, with our worst case scenario, we we're going to have it um, melt at the very beginning of the fuel cycle. Um, we just loaded it in, it's all 18% enriched uranium to 35. Um, they forgot to put the control rods in, it melts to pieces. We then found the thermal conductivity, density, specific heat, and viscosities of HD9 steel, which is our reactor vessel in lower plenum, liquid sodium, and our corium. Uh, argon and air within our system were preset with an ANSYS, and so we didn't have to look very hard to find them. For our decay heat generation, we found within a document submitted to the NRC by GE Hitachi that once the reactor shuts down, uh, there is approximately 10% decay heat um, afterwards. So for our project, we decided to go with 11% decay heat. Uh, which using our Schultes and Faw textbook, which saved us many times during this project, uh, decayed away within the course of 10,000 seconds. This graph above shows uh, time zero to time 100. Uh, initially, for the first 10 seconds, um, it is at 90 megawatts, or uh, for our heat generation, which was volumetric, it was 18 megawatts per me uh, meters cubed. Um, and it decayed to 285 watts per meters cubed um, by the time we reach 10,000 seconds and stayed at that point for the remainder of our analysis. This is our initial condition for our porosity model. Uh, everything in blue is 600 degrees Kelvin and everything is re in red is uh, 1200 degrees Kelvin. Um, the, in the middle, you'll see 10 concentric rings of sodium placed on top of our corium, as James previously mentioned on the porosity slide. Um, at this point in our model, uh, time is frozen, and we are at 18 megawatts per meters cubed, uh, heat generation within our corium, and uh, this entire system is sitting again in ambient air. The first one, layer is after uh, one hour within our system. Um, the third one on the top row is after three hours. The uh, first one on the bottom row is after a day. And our last one is after uh, 1,000 years of sitting on our plenum. Uh, our temperature contours are 81 degrees. And so, uh, any slight variation in temperature, say on the outer surface of our vessel to the air, uh, cannot be seen clearly. Uh, <clears throat> had we changed our temperature contours to be, say, one degree and then ran ANSYS, the computers within Daniel's Hall would have exploded as they almost did when I tried. These are our uh, corium temperatures versus time. You'll see that we did one case of porosity as opposed to a parametric study. This was done because as we increase or decrease the concentric rings on top of our sodium, we approach a no porosity model or a smooth, flat corium surface. You'll notice that after almost at around 10,000 or so seconds, uh, the maximum temperature within our corium and on the surface of the lower plenum goes below our eutectic limit. And so, um, as shown in the plot before, um, the peak system temperatures fall below the eutectic melt at around 2.77 hours, and the maxim maximum calculated penetration was around um, 0.015 millimeters. 
And so that showed that it limited the risk of our plenum melting at our, test, our tested worst case scenario. So having seen both our results from criticality and from heat transfer, along with our uh, a low eutectic penetration rate, we feel confident that should a, a major core disruption accident happen in an S-PRISM reactor as it is, it will safely serve as a, uh, the lower plenum would safely serve as an internal core capture with no major design changes made. Any questions? We did not. We, um, we. They are, we, we used the plot we did because they were more conservative as, uh, from, uh, at least a criticality perspective, the, uh, adding extra, uh, cladding to that would, uh, make it less reactive. Um, we believe that that would be uh, too unrealistic uh, because when fuel mounts, the clad also mounts. We also did at one point um, do a case with no porosity and uh, no cladding, uh, just fuel, and it was also subcritical. More questions? I'll take turns. Sure. <laughs> uh, I, I believe the hardest part was the skills we had to learn to perform this analysis. We used many tools that we were unfamiliar with. In fact, the first half of uh, first semester of work was largely just learning how to use these tools. Uh, ANSYS especially proved fairly difficult to learn. Thank you all for enjoying our presentation. Yeah.